Well, welcome back to um, the study of this really fascinating book of the Revelation of John. And even when we admit all our inadequacies and uh, inabilities to nail down every detail of this and to beyond any doubt, nonetheless, we can begin to grasp, I think, something of the message of the book. And I do want us to, again, come back to where we began our studies with this, that preeminently, yeah, if we can get a grasp of something of the events that will come, that's good because it's reassuring and it's encouraging. But most of all, we said we want to be revelationists. We want to see the Lord in this. We want to see more about the nature and character of our God and that he sits upon the throne and he's never going to be moved off of it. Not by men, not by devils, not by demons. That one thing uh, just shouts to us throughout this study of the book of the Revelation is God is sovereign. God alone reigns. He is God and beside him there is no other. And you'll see this again and again and again that God gives them time to repent. God gives them five months. God limits it. God gave them power. They have none unless he allows it so that he maintains his position uh, over us all. And praise be to God because he's our loving heavenly father. Last time together, we were looking at these trumpets. And these trumpets, we said, have warned mankind of worse things to come if they don't repent of their sins and turn to the Lord. And with all of that, I think we should see so clearly how patient, how unwilling and reluctant God is to judge mankind. He still loves lost men and women. He's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. And it's as though his heart breaks here. And yet, he does move, he does work in a way that would shake man, stir man to some way, awaken him to the threat that looms large over his life in the days to come. God is patient. He is ever so loving and long-suffering, but he's never to be trifled with. Indeed, there is an end to his mercy and his kindness when it is repeatedly rebuffed and refused. There reaches a point where God says, that's enough. When he says, that's enough, he can do that over an individual life. He can do that over a country. He can do that over the entire world. And that's the picture that is given to us here in the book of Revelation. So let's pray together and let's come to chapter 10 here today. Father, we do thank you so much that we can call upon your name. We're so thankful our dim eyes and blinded eyes have been opened first to see ourselves to see what great sinners we are, how worthy we are of your wrath and judgment. We're thankful our eyes were open to see ourselves. And then, thank you, Lord, our eyes were open, open to see our blessed Redeemer, our Savior, who comes with loving, pierced hands to embrace us, forgive us, wash us, and loose us from our sins. We just thank you for your wonderful salvation. So make your word plain and clear to us as is needful to us by your Holy Spirit. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, we have, as I've said, been considering these trumpets. And when we've considered this, uh, the scheme of things, you remember that we've said the seals are general. They introduce all kind of forces and factors that work out in a more precise and detailed way when we look at the trumpets and the bowls. But there is something here that's very fascinating. Once we came to the sixth trumpet, of course, it said that if the effects of it were terrible. A third of the men of the earth die in this which seems to be a world war. And it was said there that it would last, this war would last only for a year, a month, a day, and an hour. That's very precise, and it seems as though this big, dramatic, intense conflict was over very quickly and very abruptly. So that comes to an end. Now, I'm speculating. It could be that it is the Antichrist who puts an end to all these warring combatants and that paves the way for him to assume complete and utter control of the earth. That may be what is transpiring here because we know that he's, uh, he's not eliminated. As we'll soon see, he's very prominent here when he comes to dealing with the two witnesses. But so we have this six trumpet sounds. And now having sounded, we're waiting for that seventh trumpet, the last trumpet here to sound. But no, no, we come to an interlude, or we might say a parenthesis, that we've seen already this pattern. When we looked at the seven seals, you remember there was this with chapter seven. There was this interlude between the sixth seal and the seventh, and here we have another interlude between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. Now, in both cases, there is a point to this. And I think if you look at them, very much like the interlude with the seals, the interlude here has a purpose. It is a reassurance given to us. It, yes, it builds suspense to be sure that we're not immediately brought to these uh, final seals or final trumpet. But look at what happens here. With the seals, the interlude is reassuring because in spite of all that we see, God will preserve and protect his own. That's the message of chapter 7. But here is much the same. In spite of all that transpired, God is going to set apart his own for himself. And that God is still on the throne, protecting and keeping his own people and preserving them for his namesake. And that's not to say that there might not be martyrs, but he'll still keep them to the end. Very well then, let's come to chapter 10 and this interlude. Now, one of the things we're going to see here, as I said, throughout the book, and this is one of them, we're going to see flash-ups and, uh, and then flashbacks. And chapters 10 and 11 give both of those things to us. So let's have a look now at chapter 10 and verse 1. Now, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Okay, that's a very uh, powerful description given to this strong angel. And if you're thinking about it, you say, wait a minute that must be Jesus. Look at the description that we have here. 
in Revelation 1, 7, when we see the Lord revealed, uh, yes, he, he's one who comes, said to come with the clouds. And then the rainbow, we remember, was about the throne in Revelation 4, 3. That was of the God uh, head there. And then in Revelation 1, 16, prior to the Revelation uh, letters to the churches, his face was shining like the sun and his feet, they burned like burn, burnished bronze, just bright and flaming. And so here it looks as though this angel seems to be so very, very much the same as Jesus is the Jesus. Now, some have uh, suggested that, yes, this angel must be Jesus. But I want to suggest to you there are reasons to say no. This is not Jesus. Number one, the word that's used here in chapter 10 in verse 1 is, and I saw another angel, strong angel, coming down out of heaven. The word another in Greek is alos here. There are two Greek words for another. Alos means another of the same kind. Now, it's not at all right to link Jesus and put him on the same level of these angels that blew the trumpets. Oh, no. Uh, he's far above them. He's far above all principalities and powers. He's Lord of lords and King of kings, and all things are going to be put under his feet, things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. No. So the, to call him another of the same kind? No, I don't believe so. Secondly, he is called, this one is called an angel. And though you might argue that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament was an appearance, uh, we call him a theophany of the Lord Jesus, that's, you can argue about. But in the book of Revelation, Jesus is never called an angel. He's called, given many titles and many names, but angel isn't one of them, though angels figure prominently here. He's distinguished from those angels. And then the third reason why I think we should say no to this idea is that this angel has to swear an oath. In verse 5, and then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in that and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. So this angel has to, in a sense, swear an oath like or make a vow or like we'd testify in court that this, what I'm about to say, that's a dead level truth here. Jesus doesn't need to do that. He is the word. Uh, he needs swear no oath that his word stands on its own. It needs no oath or swearing to make it uh, established. So I would suggest to you that there is a reason why there's a similarity here, but they're not the, this is not Jesus. What do we make of this? I think there's a wonderful truth for us here. Those who dwell close to the Lord, very soon they begin to resemble the Lord. <laughs> He does resemble the Lord, but that's because he spent so much time with the Lord. And that is true for you and me. We're changed. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We're changed by beholding the glory of the Lord. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. Changed by beholding. The more time you and I spend with him, fellowshipping with him, uh, walking with him, you are going to be like him. You're going to be transformed. You'll begin to resemble him in our case, in our actions, in our attitudes, in our reactions. 
That's a beautiful truth. And I think it's exhibited for us here that this angel spends a lot of time before God, and so he resembles God in his appearance. And so we can also. All right, look next at what we see here, verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book, which was open. Now, the word open there in the Greek means um, it's a perfect tense. It means it was opened and it stays open. So this is available to everybody to read. And then we read this. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now, what does this indicate? Well, he strides the whole earth. This angel plants one foot on the ocean and one foot on the land, and it indicates God's complete domination over everything on the face of the earth. He's asserting complete dominion. When things are under your foot, they're under your power, they're under your control. But here this angel is given that authority by God. But it's indicative of God's authority over the whole of creation. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. So this is an assertion of God's authority. And I think, pay attention to this, because this is reassuring of what's about to happen in just a few chapters down the road here. Because not too distant from this point, we're going to read about a beast that comes up out of the sea. And we'll read about another beast that comes up out of the land. And they'll seem to have enormous power over the whole of the earth. <laughs> but don't forget that these feet are planted over all of it. That God is in control and he maintains his control. So I think it's uh, significant that the foot's one over the top of the ocean and one over the top of the land which is the very areas which these hideous, evil beasts will arise. God continues to be in control. Then we read, He cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. Now, often in Scripture you can read about this. Hosea 11 and verse 10, The Lord roars like a lion, so that... There's a, a power here in his voice that shakes and alarms. And then there he says, there are seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. Now, thunder always announces uh, a storm, doesn't it? I mean, when you're out in the yard and you hear it, <laughs> yeah, you, you know that, okay, thunder, lightning, rain. Now, it really goes lightning, thunder, rain. But you know that the thunder is warning you that there's a storm somewhere and near, near at hand. Well, that's what this is. It's a warning, thunder. And we read a lot about thunder throughout this book. But it's a warning that there's troubles coming. Trouble is on the way. Now, he goes on to say this. Verse 4, and when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, and so these are unusual. Within the loud, thunderous voice, there's discernible words. There's something understandable that was communicated with these seven thunders. And John, thinking he should do as he was told to do with every other Revelation, write it down, write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Pen in hand, he's ready to write. But then we see this, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Now that seems odd to us. Look, this is a revelation. Why are we being uh, deprived of an understanding of what's 
being said here with these thunders? Well, we must understand this, that God reveals to you and me only as much as we need when we need it. God is never verbose, if you've noticed. He says exactly what he needs to say and no more. He's, he's not one who speaks a great deal. He just doesn't. He, he, he says what needs to be said, and so we ought to take careful attention to what he does say. But yes, there are times when God withholds information from us because we don't need it. What we do need to know is here. And I want to say this about this whole book. I do believe it reveals future events to us and gives us an understanding of specific things that will come. But in that may or may not happen in our lifetime. The thing to get that is relevant to a believer in any era, in any generation, is this. No matter how much trouble you see and no matter how much chaos and upheaval you look and see around you and believers have been persecuted by governments and by religious leaders throughout the history of Christianity and you should be able to look in a book like this and say no matter what happens our God reigns. He still reigns and he will keep and preserve his own even if he allows them to undergo such torturous treatment from the hands of unbelievers. We all can look at this and understand that we have a wonderful, sovereign, righteous, long-suffering, and merciful, but holy God. And this is a message for every generation. But we do think, indeed, that there are specific things being revealed here but understand God rarely gives us details, and, and yet there, there are some pretty precise ones here. Now, this same thing happened to Daniel, and I'm not going to turn there, but Daniel 8, 26, and again in Daniel 12, and verse 9, the angel says, you know, seal these things up. Don't write this down. The time is ripe to say these things. So God tells us only what we need to know. Jesus said to his disciples, many things I have to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So he would have said more to them, but they were in no emotional or spiritual condition to receive it. We'll see when God chooses to unveil more of his plans and purposes. So then he has sworn this vow as he lifts his right hand, attesting to all that by the Lord of heaven, that all that's about to happen, he announces, will be fulfilled. And so, this seventh trumpet is to sound. And here's what he says in verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, which he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished. Now, I want to back it up to verse 6, though. He said, there will be, um, in some translations, and, and time shall be no more, in verse 6. This translation, New American Standard, says there will be um, delay no longer, which is a better understanding of that expression. Again, just by an aside, we've already talked about this. Some people, when it says time will be no more, have taken it to mean somehow that we will enter this eternal timeless state. Um, but that's not the case. There will be time and passage of time because there's events and happenings and wonderful, wonderful things to see and behold in the new heaven and the new earth. What he means is it's enough. What I've promised now. I'm going to fulfill. I've delayed it long enough. I'm not slack concerning my promises. I'm now about to fulfill them all, and Jesus will return. But now he mentions this, the mystery of God, in verse 7, is, is finished. 
There are many things called mysteries in the New Testament. There's the mystery of the kingdom. Jesus talked about that. It's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom when he spoke of, to the, about his parables to the disciples. Romans 11.25 speaks of the mystery uh, of Israel's blindness, and it is a mystery when things in the scriptures are so clear and they simply cannot see it. And then it's called the the mystery uh, of the rapture in 1 uh, Corinthians 15, uh, 11, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in, uh, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And it's, that's called a, a mystery. And then simply the Christ, the incarnate Christ is a mystery he's referred to. And then he speaks of... Uh, in husband and wife, and he says, but uh, I speak of Jesus, uh, of Christ in his bride, which is a mystery of this spiritual union that we have that can be likened to a husband and wife relationship. So that's a spiritual mystery. And then Colossians, Christ in us, this mystery, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And then there's the mystery of lawlessness when he speaks. Paul speaks there of the Antichrist and all the inculcated evil. And then outright, 1 Timothy 3.16 speaks of the mystery of his incarnation, how the second person, God, could become flesh, take flesh upon him. And here is the mystery of God. And yet, he says here, this mystery of God is to be finished. Now, when you call something a mystery here in the Bible, then it's better to understand it in this regard. It's not that, that it's like a riddle that's unsolvable, that we'll never be able to figure out. He uses this word mystery to mean that it is something uh, of a mystery to us as human beings, that they are not natural to man. This is not the way we would do things or think of things or perceive of things. It's a mystery because it's spiritual. It's a mystery because it's heavenly. But we can enter into those things by the revelation of the Spirit of God to us. So the mysteries are for us to, to grasp and to understand. So they're called mysteries, but they're not things that are here hidden like this. Other things were indeed hidden from us. God does want us to understand his mysteries. And here when he speaks of the mystery of God, I believe he's referring to the fulfillment of all of his plans and purposes from the very beginning of creation. And it's a beautiful thing. I'm reminded of these verses, one in Ephesians chapter 1, 7 to 10. Let me read it to you. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us what the mystery, there's the word, of his will. What's that will? according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan, there's the fullness of times, to do what? What's his whole plan and purpose? To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. It's all going to be summed up in Jesus Christ. This wonderful mystery of man being united with God, but not God. We're not God, but we have a union with him. And when all things are summed up in him, he will give it right back to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 25. For as by one man or by man came death, ah, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. 
For as in Adam all died, yes. Ah, so also in Christ shall all be made alive if you're in Christ. And all mankind, they're either in Adam or they're in Christ. And you can only be in Christ through the new birth and being born again. But each in his own order, Christ is the first fruits of this new creation. And then at his coming, to what we're thinking about, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom, and here's what he's going to do. It'll be given to him, but he's going to deliver the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. This is the book of Revelation. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then he will submit it all right back to the, the Father who created it all, designed it all, and purposed it all. That's where God's going with it all, to, the, to glorify his Son on the earth. So this mystery of God, he says, is now finished, completed. Verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me, saying, Go. Take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. And so I went to the angel, telling him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And so I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And sure enough, in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, oh, my stomach was made bitter. Now, this is not unlike other things we see in God's Word. Ezekiel and Jeremiah were both told to eat a scroll, take in God's Word, and it's picturesque and symbolic of take in God's Word into you. Make it a part of you. But here, specifically with John, he says, this which you to take in of the word of God and his, and his um, the word for the ages to come and the end of the age, it's going to be sweet in your mouth, uh, but the after effects, it, it's very bitter in the stomach. What is this little book? I believe this little book is, is what's to come is a revelation of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to us as believers, to think about the second coming of Christ is wonderful. It's glorious. We rejoice in it. It is sweet uh, music to our ears when we dwell on the coming of the Lord and our gathering together with Him. There's joy in that. Yes, but there is an after effect because... It is also a grief to think about what this is going to mean to lost men and women who do not know the Lord. There is a bitter sweetness. It's both bitter and sweet. When we preach the gospel to men and women and implore them to come to Christ, yes, we rejoice with great joy. When men and women come to Christ, that's joy unspeakable. But we should also weep for those who don't. Because dreadful, dreadful, dreadful uh, is the effects of such rejection of the Lord's salvation. And in the end time, it's going to be very stark, the difference between those who are in Christ and those who, who will take the mark uh, of the beast. And that is a bitter thing to consider. Well, now he ends. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Personally, <laughs> I think that that's referring to this book that little did John know that what he was writing down was going to last thousands of years and be a blessing to millions and millions of people 
and it would be read by kings and by all peoples around the world. So I think this is his part and, and place in the eternal word of God. Well, now we come to chapter 11. And I'm going to give you a moment uh, to pause this and to step aside if you, if you need to and, and come back. Um, as I said previously, as I want us to um, be able to break this up somewhat because I realize I'm giving you a lot in a, in a moment. You can always pause me. <laughs> so. But this way, it's easy to come back and find out where we are. All right, so let's come back to chapter 11. Now, this chapter includes something we've already considered, and that was this remarkable story of these two witnesses. But first, before we get to that, let's see what John is doing here in the early part of this and this we talked about is a flash up into heaven so here's what we find then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff that was a rod that was cut at a specific length so he could make measurements with it a ruler we would think and someone said get up and measure the temple of god and the altar and those who worship in it but, he says, leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and don't measure it. Now, that is the court, which was referred to as the, in the temple, you had uh, a wall, and outside that was the court of the Gentiles, which they were welcome to come, but they had to, the court of the Jews also separated between men and women. This outer court, though, speaks of the nations outside of the, of the temple or the, the holy areas. So he says to them here, don't measure that, but do measure the real temple area. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and don't measure it, for it has been given to the nations or the Gentiles, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Now, he's given a rod, he measures this. We're not given the details. We know Ezekiel also measured the temple grounds and it was gigantic, enormous in Ezekiel 40. Now, what is this temple of God he's measuring here? Now, some think, well, it's a literal temple. I really don't believe so. I think what he's speaking of here is much like we saw in chapter 7. He's delineating. When you measure something, you're demarcating it. You're delineating it. You're setting it apart. It's like a survey. This is my territory. And I, I believe what he's demarcating here is the, the people of God, that the temple here is God's people. Now, we can see references to this where the Lord's people are referred to like this as a sanctuary or a temple. We know our bodies are, but in, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you, he's speaking to the Corinthians, the church, the whole church here, don't you know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? The whole body of believers are referred to as a, as a temple. And think of this in Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 21. Because there too, it, they're referred to, the, the church is referred to as the more or less the sanctuary of the Lord. Ephesians 2 in verse 21. In whom, that is in Jesus, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into what? A holy temple in the Lord. He's talking about the church is being built as a temple to the Lord. 
So I think it's fair to say or suggest that what he's demarcating here is setting aside for himself and separating from the Gentiles, which here in this case represent unbelievers in the nations. The God's people are set aside for God, his plans and his purposes. But he sustains his own. We've seen that over and over and over again throughout the book of Revelation. Now then, what about this, though, this outer court? And here he introduces something to us. Leave out the court, which is, he says, outside the temple. And don't measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city, Jerusalem, for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, here we're introduced to an interesting point in the book of Revelation. Now, we've considered this in the past that this book is so has such a prolific use of the number seven. Does it not? Fifty-five times you'll find the number seven used in the book of Revelation. But you know what's fascinating here? Never does the book refer to seven years. Say, what? Uh, the tribulation period seven years. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe you're correct in that, but Revelation never refers to seven years. What it does refer to repeatedly, though, are three and a half years. And this is what we find here in the scriptures and in Daniel. 42 months here is referred to in 11 in verse 2. And then you'll find the same reference here in, in Revelation 13, 5. He speaks of the Antichrist. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemy and authority to act for he's the beast of the sea for what? 42 months was given to him. Then, here we see 1,260 days. That's 42 months, or three and a half years. Both of these equal up to three and a half years. 12, 6, the woman is protected here and nourished for 1,260 days, three and a half years. And then we have this expression here in 12, 14, time times and half a time 12 14 but the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time times and a half time from the presence of the serpent a time one year times two years half time half a year three and a half years. Now this is significant because if we were to turn to the book of Daniel, Daniel also makes note of that same time frame. And so we've said that this book and the Old Testament are so, so carefully linked. In Daniel 8 and verse 21, and here he speaks about this Oh, let me read it um, through for you so we can gather in what he's talking about here. But, um, sorry, I want to make sure I have my reference right for you. Let's look to... Okay, so I'm sorry that I had the wrong, I had to double check myself here. I had the wrong chapter here. It's not eight, it's seven. So let me read Daniel chapter seven, verse 21. And I kept looking and that horn was waging war with the saints. And he's talking about a picture of the, I think the Antichrist. 
and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Highest One. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. These are the last days. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms. And it will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of his, this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down or wear out the saints of the highest one. And he will intend to make alteration in times and in the law. And they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away and annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole of heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey him. So, praise God. Uh, but this is such the same picture, is it not? It's the end times. It's right before our Lord comes and wipes the earth clean and sets up his rule and dominion on the earth. In Daniel chapter 12 and verses 5 to 13, we have the same designation here, 12.5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on the other bank. And one said, the man dressed in the linen who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? And I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. Now, this then is prevalent here, not seven years, but half of it repeated over and over again. Now the question is, is this a literal three and a half years? And I want to say to you that I believe it is. And I'll tell you why here. In Daniel chapter 9, in verse 24, we have a remarkable prophecy by Daniel. And he gives us such explicit detail about the coming of the Messiah. This is a, a hugely important passage of Scripture and of prophecy. In Daniel chapter 9, in verse 24, here's what it says. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin to make atonement for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern, and here he gives some specific points of reference, from the issue of a decreed, restored, and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 weeks. And it will be built again in the plaza and the moat, even in times of distress. Then after those weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And then he mentions about the Antichrist coming. There's to be the crucifixion. Now, why do I think these three and a half years are not symbolic, they're literal? Because Look at it. What was the decree to rebuild Jerusalem? There are some decrees about the temple, but to rebuild uh, Jerusalem was Artaxerxes in 44, uh, 445 BC. 69 weeks is, a week is seven years times 69 is 483 years. 
you subtract the 445, you get 38 AD. Sir Robert Anderson is a British nobleman. He went deep, dug deeply into this whole prophecy. He came up with somehow or another 32 AD. Whatever the exact number is, perhaps we're not sure of, but in the 30s, the Messiah, he says, will be revealed. Well, that's Jesus' lifespan. It hits him exactly. And this is why it's so amazing that the Jewish people cannot see their own prophet predicted the exact arrival of the Messiah. It, he says when it will happen. He gives them the exact de decade, at least, in which he will arrive. And it's there's no other one more prominent than Jesus himself. Couple that with Isaiah 53, you wonder, you just wonder how blind they have been. Now, what about this 70th week? Well, Jesus refers to the prophecy of Daniel on the Olivet Discord, Matthew 24 and verse 15. He says, in this, in those days when the, you see the abomination of desolation, which was prophesied by Daniel, well, that's in here about Daniel prophesied this, but that's yet to be fulfilled so that if you're going to look at this, you have to say, all right, if at least you have to say this, that Daniel, Jesus attributes Daniel's prophecy to a time other than his own, but it, we know it to be a part of that 70th week period from Daniel 9. So that whatever you think of it, I think that's a double fulfillment here. One, you might say, well, that was just the, refers to the destruction of the, the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Yes, but you've already disconnected the 69th week from the 70th week. And so you're already acknowledging that there's a gap between the two. But what we do find in this abomination of desolation is exactly what Paul referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4, when he will make himself out to be God and set himself up to be worshipped as God. Let me hasten then to this. This then is the reason why I think we're dealing with actual years here, three and a half years and three and a half years. So let's come quickly now to verse 3 here in, in the book of, um, of Revelation 11. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. All right, now that's a reference to Zechariah, and we've mentioned all about this previously, that lampstands, that is where the, referred to the churches, they shine their light for him into the world. The olive trees may in that day have meant Zerubbabel and Joshua the priest, but they may have been an immediate fulfillment, but here is the ultimate fulfillment is in these two witnesses. Now, some have said, who are these guys? Well, some have said Moses. Some have said Moses and Elijah because they're, it's indefinite about their death. And likewise, Enoch and Elijah. Some have said, well, it represents the law and the prophets, which that doesn't really fit here, actually, because they're... Um, but the fact here is that whatever, whoever they are, they are going to be used. And I think there's specific individuals here that are used. Uh, and the fact there are two of them confirms their testimony. They are to be protected by, from God as they preach and prophesy. If anyone wants to harm them, and here's what we can say about them. They're protected by God. 
Fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. It's pretty gruesome. I don't necessarily think literal fire comes out of their mouth. I think that's their fiery preaching. But I do think that God devours people that try to hurt them. That God will physically protect them from their enemies. But the fire is the words, I think, that they, they preach to the world around them. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. That's like Elijah. And they have power of the waters to turn them into blood. That's like Moses. And to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Now, as I said before, and this is what's so, to me, amazing, that what is given to us here is such a picture uh, the mercy, kindness, long suffering of God that he goes to such lengths to reach lost, fallen, rebellious mankind. He's not only giving forth these trumpet judgments upon the earth, he has these two men, much like Moses and Aaron, who announces and predicts every single one of them. So that there's no question about the fact they're dealing with God. And they're simultaneously calling and begging with human beings, repent before it is too late. Flee the wrath to come. And so God is reaching out to fallen mankind, not only with his works, but with the words that come from the mouths of these two witnesses. But finally, after three and a half years of God dealing with mankind in its terrible state, he's finished. He's done all that he can do to reach them. And so he allows the Antichrist to slay them. Look what follows next. And when they have finished their testimony, their, their God is done, the beast that comes up out of the abyss, will make war with them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days, and they will not permit their dead bodies and desecrate them to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. They will send gifts to one another because these two prophets who tormented those who dwell on the earth are no more. They're euphoric. The world absolutely bursts forth in celebration of this. Why? Ah, because it appears that the Antichrist has finally overcome God himself and that somehow he's been able to throw off God's prophets. They actually think that they've beaten God and now they're free from God and they can go forward and sin all they want to without all the calamities that befell them. They're glad to be done with these men, glad to be rid of them. Oh, but wait. Something's happening. Wait a minute, something's moving. These dead bodies would be in plain view world over. Look what happens. After the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet and all their euphoria turns in at once. They're terrified because now they know their joy turns to absolute terror, because now they know they haven't won at all. What now? Well, judgment. And so they heard a voice from heaven saying, come up here. And then they went up into heaven in the cloud and their enemies watched them in horror. And in that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified gave glory to the god of heaven they knew that this is god no question about it 
The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. And what is it? Here it is. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud, now we're flashing up. What's happening in heaven? The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and you've begun to reign. And the nations, they were enraged. And your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bond servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and destroy those who have destroyed the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, the real place of God, and the ark of his covenant, all his promises, they appear in his temple, and there were flashes and lightnings and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm because now God's done. He's finished. He's coming, and he's coming to reign. The seventh trumpet announces the end. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all that you have promised and all that you will fulfill. And for all of that, we say to you, blessed be the name of the Lord.